Welcome to My Thoughts with Dale Van de Bogart, a biblical view of today's world issues. And now, here's Dale. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another edition of My Thoughts. And in, this is our second of our eight-week series on the cost of discipleship, or we like calling it just the discipleship series. Now, this week's segment, Live with a Selfless Heart, we will see an example of how Jesus, or Jesus' selflessness, created a way of salvation, and how we must live selflessly as Jesus did here on earth. Remember, Jesus is the master discipler. Now, we're going to be using two passages out of the Gospel of John, so get your Bibles out. Gospel of John, we're going to go to chapter 12, and we're going to start at verse 24. We'll go to verse 36, and then we'll jump over to verse uh, 44 and go to verse 48. Now, this segment and the other segments uh, are all based off of our book here, Throw Away the Microwave and Cook from the Crock-Pot, Making Disciples That Stay Fruitful. Now, if you want to know more and get more in-depth in discipleship and the cost of discipleship, along with definitions of, of discipleship, how to build your own discipleship course, uh, some models that we have as examples, and also combining evangel evangelism with discipleship, you need to order this book. You can get it from our website, which I'm going to talk to you all about right at the end of, of our lesson today. So stay tuned. So now most of us are familiar with a social media tool called Twitter. And it gives anyone the ability to follow anyone and discuss any topic, even their own topics as well. Now, there's also a feature within Twitter that allows anyone to unfollow that person. So let's relate this to following Jesus. Now, as long as the circumstances play in their favor, hey, they're going to follow Jesus, not a problem. But once the tide of public opinion turns against Jesus, many will unfollow. Now, one thing I want you to do, I don't want you to confuse selfishness with selflessness. Two different words, two different meanings. Now, our culture today is very selfish. So we have a lot of selfishness that justifies and promotes vanity. See, some of the most popular reality shows are where the participants are notoriously self-indulgent. No genuine follower of Jesus Christ can ever include selfish words, thoughts, or actions in their lives. Following Jesus consists of the demand that believers die to self, follow their, uh, or focus their lives, and service on God's will. Now, selfishness is a rebellion against God. The selfish choice of Adam and Eve to disobey God's command in the Garden of Eden brought a legacy of sin and death to humanity. Now, Jesus came as the selfless servant and to lay down his life in payment for our sins. So, in our passage today, Jesus teaches us to live with a selfless heart. So, everyone got your Bibles open, don't care what if, you, if it's paper or, or digital or if uh, or whatever translation, I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. If you have one, great. If you don't, great. Doesn't matter. Follow along. We're going to start in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 24. So, let's go. Now, remember, a lot of, this is Jesus talking now. Okay, so most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls onto the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. 
Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Therefore the people stood by and heard and said that it had thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, and I, if I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. Then he said, signify by what death would he die? The people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. While you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons and daughters of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Now let's go to verse 44. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as the light of the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe me, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive my words that has that, that, has that which judges him, the word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, a little introduction for his disciples. See, Jesus, after Lazarus, from, uh, raised, well, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead on the outskirts of Jerusalem, the Pharisees decided in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 53, that they could no longer afford to let Jesus continue to teach and heal. So they began plotting to kill him. Jesus entered the city with his disciples in the days leading up to the Passover. Jesus sought to prepare his disciples for these events. He explained the necessity of his death on the cross. He also instructed us to continue the work following his resurrection and return to the Father. Now, in verse 24, Jesus teaches us to become unselfish in our hearts. So, in that verse, Jesus referred to himself as a kernel of wheat, planted in the ground, if it to become a new, reproducing plant. Jesus would unselfishly give his life on the cross, so that a great harvest of repentant souls would achieve salvation. New life for a believer came at the expense of our Lord and Savior's sacrificial death. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was unique in its power to save, yet it was also the example in verse 25, as we read, of Jesus' self-giving, which, which disciples are to follow. If we're our disciple, we would follow. We will follow. Now, Jesus contrasted two views of human life. The first view is to love living in this world. Now, that person lives selfishly, makes decisions for their own personal benefit. The second view is to hating living in this world. Now, this person lives selflessly, makes decisions which benefit others more than themselves. Now, the indwelling Holy Spirit empowers Jesus uh, as his followers, and we follow Jesus Christ, to live this way and to follow Jesus' unselfish example. Now, in, uh, in verse 27 through 33, we're gonna, Jesus considers the cost of living selflessly and dying on the cross for our sins as the most challenging decision 
in all of human history. But without it, we wouldn't have salvation. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for all of us. Because that was meant for all of us. Jesus said, no, nah, I'll take care of it once and for all. That suffering, yeah, it involved, it cannot be adequately measured or even described what he went through. He confessed that he was troubled in verse 27, similar to what he felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus would not ask the Father to save him. He had come this hour for the very purpose of giving himself as the sacrifice for all sinners, for every one of us. He prayed for God the Father to glorify his name through selfless life and sacrificial death. In this context, Jesus declared his humanity and willingness to suffer for our sins. In doing so, Jesus revealed the Father's love and mercy in sending him as our Lord and Savior and the sacrificial lamb for the atonement of our sins. And also, too, we can be reconciled to God, redeemed from the curse. We have healing and prosperity, forgiveness of our sins, love, joy, peace, and many others. That's all that what Jesus did on the cross for all of us. And all we have to do is accept him as Lord and Savior and accept what he did and follow his example. And when we obey the Lord and accomplish his will for our lives, we glorify his name. Now, there is a difference between spiritual light, spiritual darkness. Now, in verses 35 and 36, see, they realize the urgency when Jesus uses the example of physical light and darkness extensively in his teaching. He did that to show a spiritual light. And, and spiritual darkness. See, Jesus converted this, again, like I just mentioned, into spiritual light and darkness when he said he's the true light in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9. Only Jesus can lead the lost out of spiritual darkness into spiritual light. But it takes us as disciples to plant those seeds. Plant those seeds, that's God's word into, you know, and tell them. And then their hearts get receptive, and then Jesus will bring them out of spiritual darkness, put them right into spiritual light. Hallelujah. Just like he did me, my wife, and a lot of you who are watching this right now. People moving into spiritual light can see clearly and do not fall into unseen dangers. Now, what about spiritual darkness? Well, see, however, they stumble and fall and collide into unseen dangers. It's a, it's a physical picture of the spiritual urgency of unbelievers needing Jesus in their lives so they don't stumble, fall, and collide into unseen dangers. Only those who believe in Jesus Christ are saved from spiritual darkness. Now, in verses 37 through 43, which I know we didn't read, but I want to give you a little 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 background on them. See, Jesus foretold their unbelief. And John records that the persistent unbelief of many Jewish leaders had seen Jesus perform these miracles. He identified their unbelief as a fulfillment of prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, and staying in, uh, in the book of Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 10. So beginning now, in verse 44, John provided a summary of the necessity of believing in Jesus and following him. The term cried in verse 44 is not a reference to weeping. Instead, to Jesus' sounding forth a necessary declaration publicly and with intensity. Jesus emphasized that believing in him is the same as believing in the Father who sent him. Now let me conclude our segment today. 
that Jesus coming in human flesh was to reveal the eternal Father. And we read that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18. When Philip asked to see the Father, Jesus rebuked him in John 14, verse 9, and explained to, and explained to see him was to see the Father. So you're looking, you're looking at God, because Jesus was God in the flesh, or they like using the term incarnate. See, Jesus was not referring to physical features, but to the holy nature and exact purpose shared by the entire Trinity. Jesus blessed those who believe in him without having to see him in the flesh, as we read in the Gospel of John chapter 20, verse 29. Following God requires dying to self to live for him, counting the cost of discipleship, knowing the urgency of selfless sharing and living his message, and confidently walking in his light with full assurance of your salvation. Amen? And I'm Dale Vandebogart, and I fully agree on God's word. And if you have not made Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or accept him as Lord and Savior today, what are you waiting for? You can go to our website right now, vdbm.org, click on free gift, read that entire page. At the bottom, we have our prayer. You say that prayer from your heart, and you will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you will start becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, our book here that we're promoting right now, Throw Away the Microwave and Cook from the Crock Pot, uh, Making Disciples That Stay Fruitful. Uh, again, our, our eight-week teaching on the cost of discipleship, along with everything I mentioned, evangelism with discipleship, meaning of discipleship, how to build your own discipleship courses for your church, or how about revamping yours? If you don't have one, if you don't have one, you can build one. If you have one, you can revamp it if, if need be. This book will tell you all how to do it. We'll give you some examples of some models, very popular models that are out there. This is a really great how-to book, and it's meant for everyone. For the single person that just wants to know about discipleship, for small groups, you can absolutely use it for your small groups. You can use it for your churches to build or revamp your discipleship. How about you pastors out there? What about you all to, to, to really see about discipleship and knowing, are you discipling your flock? And this book is available on our website, vdbm.org. Click on Publications, click on the, the graphic, and down at the bottom of that page will be a link, take you right to Amazon, and you can purchase this book, or as many books as you need, you can purchase those. Please remember that every, every all the dollars that are purchased for this book go right back into our ministry, so we may bless others with more publications and and more and more just building the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So uh, I want to thank everyone for watching this video and the other videos as well on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can always like and follow us on Facebook. I pray that you receive a huge blessing from this video and the other videos as well. So, once again, thank you so much for watching. God loves you. We love you. Be blessed.